Great. Well, thank you guys so much um, for joining us today uh, for a webinar on custom annotation groups for publishers. A um, little bit of organization about how um, we're going to present today. Um, first, I'll just say a few words about Hypothesis. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how it works, um, some of the details about integrating it. Then um, we want to show you some uh, publisher use cases uh, in the wild. I want to spend the majority of time um, actually showing you live sites. So uh, if I speed rather quickly through uh, some things at the beginning and there's questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, Nate's going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing on the education front and some upcoming events, and then we should have plenty of time uh, at the end for, for QA. So a little bit about uh, Hypothesis. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are a mission-driven nonprofit. Um, we're an open source technology company uh, that is working on uh, enabling annotation over all knowledge um, on the web. Um, you can see some of our funders at the bottom of the screen there. And we're in the process of um, working towards transitioning uh, to an earned income model, uh, both with publishers and uh, with education verticals. Um, we are darn close to 4.5 um, million annotations. Uh, I think we'd be, we'd be close to 4.6. You have to check these things frequently. Um, you can see on the screen here the annotations uh, fall into a couple of um, different categories. Uh, standard, pretty standardly, um, about 20% of the annotations are done in the public channel. Um, about 20% uh, are done by users who keep them completely private uh, for their own purposes. And then 60% happens in collaboration groups. So it's, um, it's that sort of uh, bit of the iceberg underneath the water that we don't see where a lot of exciting things are happening. Um, so uh, we're happy to be able to share information on that. Um, just about two years ago, the W3C published annotation as a web standard. Um, for, so what that means is basically in future versions of browsers, just like you tell your browser what your preferred search engine is, you'll be able to say, and I use a particular uh, annotation client. Um, the goal uh, being that there can be multiple annotation clients, and if they're all based on the standard, um, annotations that are made will be able to interact with each other, just like we can email back and forth, even though we use different email clients today. So I wanted to start um, just uh, kind of briefly setting up the situation of, you know, how annotation is different than commenting, because I think we've, we've had commenting for, for some time and some publishers have not had good experiences with it. And, um, you know, annotation is really, I think, quite a different animal. Um, so just, just to kind of briefly touch on that, um, you know, one uh, thing is actually connection. Uh, between annotations and between annotators. So comments as, as previously incorporated into websites were really stranded on their individual pages. Um, and there was no way to really get a 30,000 foot view of um, what had been done across the website um, or what had been done by an individual person. Um, now through group and individual activity pages, uh, it's really easy to get an idea of, um, uh, of, of activity in the space to search and explore annotations there uh, and um, you know, pursue those annotations to their original locations. Um, those 20% uh, public annotations of the larger cohort, we do send to Crossref for inclusion in their event data project. Um, and indexing by uh, Google, so those are discoverable. Um, the second point that I like to focus on is uh, the collaboration factor. Um, so again, you know, we, we tend to think about public annotation, but there's so much going on uh, kind of underneath the surface. Um, uh, as of yesterday, I had, had uh, uh, Nate run some numbers again. There are 32,000 collaboration groups um, on Hypothesis, so lots of activity um, there. Um, and then finally, uh, persistence. So each annotation has a unique persistent web address, so you can cite it. Um, and annotations are available uh, for folks to uh, download and utilize their own annotations for organizations uh, who want to connect to our uh, API. You can see the public annotations, or if you sponsor a group, you can see your group annotations as well. So a lot of, um, of differences there that simply were not uh, possible with comments. 
Um, one example that I like to mention, um, again, when thinking about how comments differ from annotations is really, um, you know, not so much focusing on quantities of activity, but really looking at quality. So just a little um, case study. Um, about a year ago, PubMed um, announced that they were discontinuing PubMed Commons um, because of um, relatively low uptake in comparison to the whole corpus of articles um, on PubMed. Um, so a number of folks reached out to us uh, via Twitter uh, to see if we could actually rescue these um, comments before they disappeared. Uh, so we worked together with, um, with PubMed and Europe PMC uh, to, to be able to gather these comments, uh, to add um, DOIs to them, uh, to add PubMed IDs in the form of tags to make them more findable, um, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable. And um, now, uh, if you look at the tag there at the top, PubMed Commons Archive, if you go into Hypothesis and you actually search for that tag, you'll have the entire corpus of um, annotations that will come up. Um, recently, we made uh, these annotation layer uh, visible on top of um, Europe PMC by default. So if you don't want to um, mess around with browser extensions, you can go and take a look at it um, live on Europe PMC. Um, and uh, you can also explore uh, via our page. Uh, and the slides will have a link so you can, you can take a look. Um, so a little bit um, about how we envision annotation um, over the version of record on the web. We think about it in terms of layers. So you have the article on the publisher website. The article never moves the book chapter, or the, the document, the blog, um, but you can have a number of different conversations happening simultaneously on top of it. You can have that public channel that I mentioned where people are adding information that they think will be generally useful to whoever comes to the page. You can have a private group such as a, a classroom uh, working on that same article with their annotations only visible to folks who are part of the group. Um, and you can have publishers inviting authors, uh, expert communities, and also um, uh, even the publisher staff, which I'll show you some examples, um, adding um, layers of, of uh, annotation. And depending upon what you've come to the page to do, you can toggle back and forth between those different layers, just like you might monitor, monitor different channels with a messaging tool that you use internally now. Um, the way that Hypothesis works, there's kind of two parts. There's that bit that pops out over the content. Um, that's the client. Um, so you can use it to annotate any web page, uh, HTML, PDF, um, or EPUB. And then where the annotations are stored, which is um, on our server. So each time you open up a page, a call will go to the server, say, hey, are there any annotations on this page that this user can see? So that would include public annotations any uh, annotations that you've made yourself, as well as any groups that you're a part of. Um, this keeps uh, readers on top of the version of record, precluding the need for them to um, you know, move a copy of the PDF into a scholarly collaboration network uh, or other site. Uh, keeps them returning to your content as they review their notes, as they follow uh, through collaborative groups um, with other researchers. Uh, we provide um, analytics, which I'll talk about in a little bit, so you can note um, engagement that's happening uh, in these different contexts. Um, the uh, publisher controls um, the group on their site, and I'll show you a different a few different options with that. Um, and this breaks down the content silos um, and maximizes the opportunity for discovery of annotations and their respective content. Um, and the, a the APIs enable repurposing of data, for example, if you want to do text and data mining on top of it, or if you want to set up a widget uh, to display recent annotations on another part of your site, you can definitely do that. Um, so, as I mentioned before, we're an open source uh, company, so the code base is available for anyone who wanted to take it and integrate it into the site. Uh, you don't even have to tell us you're doing it. We like if you do, uh, because we'd like to help you be successful. Uh, but if you want to work with us um, to enable this um, branded and, and moderated layer, which I'll be showing today, um, we're happy to do that. Um, we do offer document-based pricing. Uh, and the wider you deploy on your site, the cheaper it is on a per document level. We use the number of documents that you add per year as a proxy for publisher size, but you can deploy back to volume one, issue one, or earliest copyright year um, if we're looking at books. And you can certainly start with a smaller pilot or you can go all in across the entirety of your site. 
If you already have um, existing accounts that are widely used, um, you know, we are able to offer a uh, single sign-on, which um, we can talk about more in the, in the Q&A if folks are interested. Um, the two types of groups that I'm going to be showing today are the open group. Um, this is world readable, world writable, as we say. Anyone can participate. And then the restricted group, when a publisher has a more specific use case in mind, which is still world readable, but the only folks who can create annotations are folks who are part of the uh, approved uh, annotators for that group. Um, we offer UI customization, um, full customer support from our amazing client services team, uh, open source maintenance to continue to approve the code, uh, fix any bugs, anything like that. And what I like to point out as the most important thing is a success program to make sure that you can achieve your goals with annotation and that we can put together the training and outreach that will help you get there. So a little bit more about integrating um, hypothesis. Um, so these publisher groups, I think I've uh, probably covered everything here, um, but just an example on the side of how different group layers uh, might display depending upon how you've, you've set things up. Um, so you can toggle back and forth uh, between those. Um, different configurations, as I mentioned, and many publishers are, are selecting uh, to offer, um, you know, kind of mix and match. So one layer for general discussion, perhaps one for authors, perhaps one for uh, staff updates and, and the like. I'll show you uh, some of that. And um, I mentioned before these group activity pages. So these function as uh, group dashboards. So when you go, uh, whether you're an individual user, going to your page, uh, you can see annotations there, or um, going to the group page, uh, you can browse and search there, you can uh, click on tags, you can uh, do domain queries across URLs to see if there's uh, annotations already existing on your content, um, or you can filter by groups. Um, so it's a great way to explore. Um, and again, I'll, I'll tell you more about this uh, if, if there's a high level of interest. Um, analytics, um, we're frequently asked, you know, what kind of reports we do. So you receive full analytics um, on, of course, uh, annotations that are made that are, that are public. Uh, for anything that is made in uh, either your public group or in the Hypothesis public channel, you can see who made it, uh, when it was made, upon which document, uh, what the selection was, and what the user uh, had to say about it. Uh, for things that are private and groups that are private, of course, um, that's information that's not available, but you can still see the number of annotations, uh, the documents where those annotations occurred, uh, and the time that they happened. Um, so even if you can't 100% see the activity, it's still um, a great indicator that engagement is happening on top of the document. Um, you can look at key uh, annotator segments, for example, in the, um, in the neuroscience and neurobiology space, uh, research resource identifiers are used for reproducibility purposes. So there, if you fall into that space, uh, more than 125 journals, you probably already have some SciBot uh, annotations on your content. We report those as well, the number of um, annotators, the number of new annotators, um, as well as uh, top annotators and top annotated pages. So lots of information that you can get uh, from analytics. And if there's other um, types of metrics you would like us to capture, uh, we would uh, love to hear from you and, and try to work out how we can make that happen. So um, just a little, a quick slide. Um, you know, I'm asked all the time, well, you know, who's using Hypothesis? Um, you know, how many publishers have done an integration? So um, because end users can get accounts for free and Hypothesis can be used anywhere on the web, you know, a lot of times I just say, oh, all of them. Um, these are publishers who've done uh, specific integrations and have specific projects underway, but because Hypothesis can be used anywhere, uh, if you're not amongst this group of publishers, there, um, there may well be annotations on top of your content, and if you want us to look into that um, more closely, we'd be happy to do so. So I'm going to jump over um, in just a second and show you some live examples. Uh, to do that, I need to um, quickly make a trip to my other browser. So I'm going to go out of full screen and hand over to Nate to tell you a little bit about about our education space. Hey, thanks, Heather. Well, um, while you're doing that, maybe I'll share my screen so I can just show the slides. Super. Okay, great. So we noticed um, uh, amongst the folks registering that there might be some folks who are coming from um, 
higher education or a teaching and learning um, background, interested in hypothesis. And, um, you know, a lot of what Heather's been talking about has been specific to um, publishers, of course, um, which, you know, uh, oftentimes colleges and universities are also publishers, right? But for the teaching and learning context, we just wanted to um, let you know that uh, recently, Hypothesis launched an integration with all the major learning management systems, including you know Blackboard, uh, D2L, Canvas, Moodle, and Sakai, um, and it, basically any LMS that uh, is LTI compliant, Learning Tools Interoperable uh, Standard compliant. And so um, there's more information about this on our site. We're not going to delve into it today. And uh, we have our Director of Education, Jeremy Dean, uh, heads up this effort uh, working with teaching and learning and um, would love to connect with anyone who's more interested in that. Uh, and so I'll just share in chat here um, a link to a blog post that we um, issued uh, recently um, that, uh, I can't figure out how to get back to chat. <laughs> okay, Shows how often I drive. It, um, while I'm talking. In a okay, minute. I will, yeah, we'll share the link while Heather's talking in a second. Um, but at any rate, uh, there's a, a lot of really exciting things happening now in the teaching and learning space with this ability for uh, teachers and students to be able to annotate um, with single sign-on in their own learning management systems. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that in case that's um, the an area of your interest. Um, we have both um, a pilot program and a partnership program like we have with, with um, publishers um, working with higher education and even K-12. Uh, and then also we just wanted to mention that um, coming up uh, here in May uh, we'll be uh, participating in the seventh annual I Annotate conference. So it's, uh, it's the only conference that's really dedicated to digital annotation. It happens annually this year. It's going to be in Washington, D.C. for the first time at the newly refurbished headquarters of the AGU, the American Geophysical Union, um, which is the first net zero uh, refurbished building in the nation's capital, which is really cool. So we're excited to go to that. You'll notice the kind of fancy artwork here for I Annotate. Each year, I Annotate takes up a theme. This year, it's Annotation Unleashed, the web at 30. And uh, actually, thanks to Heather's creativity, um, we the conference has moved toward a kind of heavy metal uh, tour uh, motif. And so that's, uh, that's why it's all looks all red and uh, spidery. They're a little scary, uh, but don't be scared. It's going to be an awesome conference. There will be folks there um, both from the publishing world, um, research scholars, scientists, technologists, journalists, fact checkers, people from teaching and learning and education. And so it really brings together everyone um, who's uh, focused on or thinking about annotation uh, across all the different disciplines. Um, and it's a two day event uh, that will be again in the Washington DC area followed by a one day do-a-thon hack day where people actually pull up their sleeves and dig in and do work on annotation. Um, I will also share the link to the iAnnotate website uh, after Heather takes back over here so that um, you can take a look at the preliminary program. There's actually still time to submit um, <laughs> submit proposals if you have actually been working in annotation already and have something that you'd like to share with, with the assembled crowd uh, at I Annotate. And then there's uh, February 17th is the deadline for proposal submission. Uh, so that information is all on the website. So we just wanted to make sure you knew about that. Um, so certainly if you're in the East Coast area, it would be easy to get to. Um, and uh, we would welcome and love to see everyone uh, who's on this uh, webinar uh, come to that and really um, have a deeper dive in this kind of uh, really collaborative, uh, intimate environment where it's usually between 100 and 200 people gathered and really focused on annotation for a couple of days. It's a great event. Okay, so Heather, do you want to take it back over? Yep, I think I have. Um, can you? Uh, yes, you have. You okay, have. just just sorry to jump the gun there. That thank thanks no problem. Me, um, for taking care of that while I did a couple of housekeeping items in this uh, in this window. Um, so as promised, you know, I do want to spend um, some time showing you some uh, some publisher groups um, and different use cases um, that are that are live now. Um, and, uh, and we'll be sharing the, the slides and I think that there are, are links uh, um, that to go visit some of these uh, in context. So almost exactly a year ago today, actually uh, a year ago tomorrow on January 31st, 
um, we launched the eLife uh, collaboration. So eLife was the first uh, publisher that we work with to develop um, publisher-specific features and functionalities. So um, we're, we're glad to say that um, as a result of their uh, uh, collaboration with us, these are now available uh, through the publisher groups, you know, that I've been describing. Um, so uh, we find ourselves now on an eLife article. Um, the way that you launch annotation in eLife is to simply start annotating, or you can click on this tab here. It's got the nice little number badge, so you can see the kind of number of annotations on the page. Um, one of the projects that eLife um, has had underway is inviting authors as part of the workflow process to introduce themselves. So here we can see on this article that Ben Engel um, has uh, introduced himself and added um, some update links. He's been interacting uh, with some readers on top of his content. Um, at the top of the client, here to the right, you can see the eLife branding, uh, the indication that this is their uh, layer as well as um, the moderation flag here at the lower right. So if I were to click the moderation flag, the eLife moderator would get uh, a notice uh, to go and review that annotation, annotation for uh, its appropriateness. Um, so publishers designate uh, their own moderators for these layers. Um, and uh, some of the customizations um, can be seen here, you know, matching, matching fonts um, and the like. So this is an open group. Um, any of you who want to play around with annotation can go uh, to eLife. It does use eLife accounts, so you would need to make an eLife account um, in order to, to participate, have your ORCID handy, because that's um, what everything hinges upon. Um, and one of the things that, one of the reasons I like to show this article is you can see at the top here, there's a big red banner that this article had a correction. And if we click on the page note, which is an article level annotation, um, you can see details about this particular correction. In this case, a uh, citation was missing and it was added. So um, eLife staff and, and staff at other publishers have found uh, annotation cards to be a useful way, uh, not to replace the regular uh, update uh, flow, but to draw attention of the readers that um, something has changed in the article. So again, this is an, this is an open group. Um, I want to show you another open group. Um, this is through collaboration with American Psychological Association, which launched last fall. Um, and you can see each publisher kind of integrated things a little bit differently. So uh, uh, APA uses a little uh, button here at the top. Um, so if I click on that, it's going to open the uh, APA publishing open group. Um, and in this case, um, one of the projects that APA has done is they looked at their top downloaded articles for 2018 and they invited um, several of the authors uh, who are responsible for them to um, provide some updates. So in this case, um, Russell Warren has done an excellent job um, adding some, some links, um, some notes. Uh, here's a little video of an interview that um, he recorded, which you can play. Hi, everybody. Uh, right I'm here, here with Dr. Browser. Russell Warren. He is the associate professor of... Um, and just did, did a really uh, amazing job um, utilizing tags and the like. Um, so that might be a use case which might appeal uh, to, to many of you. Um, so these are open groups, but some publishers have really specific use cases in mind when they come to us, where they're not quite sure that they want to open things up um, yet for, for, for everyone to annotate. So the first, um, uh, what we call a restricted group, uh, we put together for American Diabetes Association, and this actually launched in the spring last year. Let me scroll up. So every January, uh, ADA publishes an update to the standards of medical care in diabetes. And they wanted to have a mechanism to uh, add additional information and updates without waiting for the next annual cycle to come around. So we created a group for them that's world readable to anyone who lands on the ADA site. But the only folks who can create annotations into this layer um, are the ADA staff. So you can see they've got their account um, is the na same name as their, as their group. Um, they really did an amazing job with these um, updates. If I scroll down here, they treated them like true uh, first class research objects. So you can see the date that the annotation was originally published, the date it was approved by their uh, publications uh, committee, a suggested citation, and some tags. And I, and I do like to you know, highlight again that you can cite uh, these annotations because they do have a unique persistent uh, identifier. Um, so if we go to the ADA group activity page, I've mentioned these um, dashboards and activity pages before. These are all of the updates that um, ADA actually included on this issue last year. So you can go in and you can um, see 
what these uh, updates uh, consisted of. You can use the little um, view annotation in context to go to the article and be scrolled down right to the annotation. You can share out annotations. Uh, you could search uh, this. Um, and they've also included these helpful tags. So if I just want to see updates that um, are uh, referring to hypoglycemia, I can click on that. It's going to add my filter at the top. And again, um, uh, these, are, these are great ways to, to find content. They've got internal links, external links. They've added some tables and charts. Uh, really did a nice job. Another example of a restricted uh, group is a project that we did, um, Cambridge University Press, together with Syracuse University's Qualitative Data Repository, thus the little QDRs here at the top and the little logo that they've got. And um, this is a project called Annotation for Transparent Inquiry, and it's designed to bring context to citations in the social sciences in the same way that um, citations have become more transparent uh, in, the, in the hard sciences. So um, in, in each case, if I click on, a, on an annotation card, um, you can see that this particular uh, annotation is tied to this sentence, uh, but it gives the author the ability to add a lot of additional information about methodology, about sources, um, additional links, um, connections to the, to the data, uh, translations that they would not have been able to fit into the article for space limitations on the print side and for maybe um, uh, some limitations on the electronic side as well. So um, this is a project that is uh, includes about six other publishers in addition to Cambridge. Um, we're in the process now of making these annotations visible on um, those other publisher sites. Uh, again, like the uh, like the page, the group page that I mentioned over uh, ADA, you can click on the group activity page and see all of the articles across Cambridge um, that are part of this project and explore them and share them and the like. Um, a lot of the publishers that we talk to are interested in what annotation can do in regards to peer review. Um, this is an interdisciplinary journal called Murmurations. It's hosted on the PKP uh, iteration of uh, OJS. Um, and what they've done here is they've created a restricted group for each article, uh, includes the authors, the journal editor, and the reviewers. Uh, and they work in a completely open uh, peer review process. If we scroll down a little bit, you can see an interaction here between uh, Linda Vanasupa, who's the editor, um, and the author, Chantal uh, Beebe. Um, if the public wants to add annotations, um, they can't do it in this group, but they can hop over to the Hypothesis public channel and do so there. So it's a great example of utilizing uh, peer review, uh, annotation and peer review. Another project around peer review, um, and I don't have any screenshots of this, I do apologize, some should be coming soon, um, is a project that uh, Biomed Central did in collaboration with a company called Research Square. Um, four of the BMC journals offer this um, as an option, and uh, I'm told that more are coming soon. So when an author submits a manuscript uh, to one of these journals, they are offered the opportunity to opt in to what's called in-review. Um, so in-review is uh, something that is designed to bring more transparency to peer review. So in parallel with the traditional peer review, uh, if I scroll down here, you can see uh, community feedback is welcomed through use of the hypothesis uh, tool. Um, and uh, the interest from authors in opting into this project has been uh, really, really high. And we're working together with Biomed Central and Research Square to kind of give um, you know, kind of jumpstart uh, suggestions and best practices uh, to uh, get going with this, with this tool. So this is, uh, this is in review. And then I want to show you um, our latest publisher uh, to launch, um, which is the American Society for Plant Biologists. I'm really, really excited about this collaboration here. And again, um, in, the, in the area of peer review, um, ASPB had uh, in the plant cell been publishing uh, what they call peer review reports. But these peer review reports were being published as supplemental material. 
they really weren't getting a lot of attention. Folks didn't re realize they were there. The, the click-through rate was, was relatively low. So they wanted um, to utilize a hypothesis to draw attention to these peer review reports. So here um, we've had um, one of the staff members from ASPB who's added um, an annotation here that this article has a peer review report. It doesn't change the existing workflow, doesn't require moving, but if I click on that peer review report, you see it will take me to uh, the PDF and, and there's a lot of information about the peer review. So we're hoping that this will dramatically increase the visibility um, around these peer review reports that they've done. Um, just like uh, the other uh, examples that I showed you, um, they have their uh, activity page. So you can see how many um, links they've gone ahead and added uh, about peer review reports. Um, so all of the peer review reports can be discovered um, and explored uh, from here. Um, and because they're using Hypothesis for some other purposes, um, they're using peer review report as one tag. Uh, but one of the other projects that they're interested in looking at is um, drawing attention to activities that happen on their blog. Like so many society publishers, they have a content site uh, and a member site, you know, and perhaps even, you know, you might even have more than that. And how do you bridge these sites together? Well, with one annotation um, group, you can scope it to multiple websites. Uh, so for your uh, members and your readers, you can offer this uh, kind of bridge uh, through annotation. So um, ASPB had been offering these, um, uh, what they call first author profiles, um, but they live in a separate site. So uh, they're kind of hidden here under extras on the side. So we're working with them to uh, grab images of the authors, a couple sentences of their bio, um, and, uh, and, and providing a link. And we will be embedding hypotheses on top of the Plante uh, blog so that folks can actually add annotations there as well. So this um, is just a, a smattering of the um, use cases that publishers are looking at now for annotation. Uh, and I'm happy uh, to be able to show you. And um, now we'll open it up for questions. Hey, Heather, that was great. Um, so we have one question so far right. <clears throat> from Allison, and she's asking if annotations are captured in altmetric scores. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and we're in conversation with um, altmetrics about this um, now. Um, there's a couple types of, of annotations. So it might well be that annotations are captured in a couple of different ways. For public annotations, of course, um, we can set up a connection with Altmetrics that will enable folks to click through and, and see what the annotator has written. But because there um, are private annotations on top of content, that's also an indication of engagement. So we may end up with uh, two colors um, on the donut. Um, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what the timeline will be uh, for that happening, but um, you know, I would say you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, one thing you know, I kind of add on that, I heard a great presentation at the uh, Altmetrics uh, 5 a.m. meeting back in September, and it was a presenter from Taylor and Francis talking about how when they found a really interesting Altmetrics story, um, they would go back to authors and ask authors to maybe do a little update of the article and then share that update through social media to kind of uh, build on that um, interesting story. We think the same thing is definitely possible and you know, eLife is doing a little bit of this now uh, to um, promote out uh, interesting uh, annotations or conversations that are happening. Um, one of the things I didn't draw attention to, but I should have, is um, each one of the annotations can be shared through um, a variety of different social media or by email. And uh, the folks who get the link don't have to have a Hypothesis account or even know what Hypothesis is. If they click on the link and they can get to the content, they will be taken to the content, scrolled down to the annotation, and they can see that there. You can also share from the top of the client if you want to share out a fully annotated article. So um, in addition to uh, kind of having uh, annotation included as alt metrics, um, you know, we're talking to publishers of how they can again take these unique stories and build upon them uh, from a promotional standpoint. Hey Heather, we've got an, a new question from Paul. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between layers and groups in annotation? Yes. Um, so let me let me. That's a great question. Um, so there are a 
a lot of different types of groups. Um, I talked about the um, the hypothesis pub types of different layers of groups. I talked about the hypothesis public channel. So this is the uh, the public annotations that anyone can make anywhere on the web. Um, they don't require uh, a publisher to have done an integration or a website to have done an integration. They are brought um, through a browser extension or a bookmarklet. Uh, and once you're uh, good to go with the Hypothesis account and you have those things, you can discover um, annotations anywhere. Um, private groups, uh, as I showed in the um, when I talked about in the in the in the group slide, um, are as as you might gather from the name, um, completely private. So no one would know that those annotations are there unless they're part of the group. Um, they join the group um, through uh, a link. Uh, this is the way most of our um, educational um, use cases happen, uh, but as, as well in the researcher content, uh, pub some publishers are doing internal workflow projects um, you know, through, through completely private groups. Um, and then we have these sponsored uh, groups uh, from publishers. So you know, I think the best um, way to describe it is that uh, if you if a publisher supports a group uh, on top of their content, that's going to be the group visible by default. So all of these examples that I showed from eLife to APA to ADA for folks who are not um, you know regular annotation users, they're going to see the publisher group uh, by default when they come to the content, um, and uh, they can switch into other channels. Um, if they prefer, you know, to, to do that or if they want to go into one of their private groups. Um, but it's a signaling mechanism uh, on the part of the publisher that this is uh, something that um, they're participating in, that they're supporting uh, in comparison to the, to the regular public channel. So the idea if, if is that you can toggle. Um, so you can see if I drop down my groups menu, I'm in a part of a lot of groups. So depending on what I've come to the page to do, um, I can move into that channel. If I go into the hypothesis channel here, um, you know, I can, uh, I can take my notes or make public annotations separate from uh, the ASPB uh, channel, which is the, the plant cell reviews here. Um, so it's kind of a winding answer to your question, Paul. So if you had um, something a little bit more uh, specific in mind, um, you know, please refine um, and I'll try to do a better job. Hey, that's great to be able to see it live too, um, Heather. Uh, so next up, a question from Sarah. Um, have we had in issues with annotations showing up to other users um, outside of a private group? And if so, what can be done about that? I have never heard of that happening. Um, I don't know, I can, Nate, if you've heard about it? Well, I, I can think of one example. So um, in, in some of the teaching and learning examples that we had before we had the LMS integration deployed, um, you know, it was really up to each individual user to make sure that they were annotating in the group or layer that they wanted to <laughs> or that they were supposed to. So mm -hmm. for example, in a lot of like college or university classes, the instructor would ask students to annotate in a private group. But as Heather was just showing, in order to annotate in a private group, you actually need to go to that group menu and select it, like she's showing on the screen now, to make sure that you're not annotating in the public layer and are instead annotating in a, in a private group. And so most of the cases we've seen where somebody has sort of accidentally annotated in the wrong layer or group um, have come from that, just sort of not realizing that you had to switch mm -hmm. to that group and make those annotations there. Yeah, um, maybe I can show just quickly so this is a group that we use at Hypothesis for internal purposes. So if I uh, grab some, some text here. Do, 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 do. Right, uh, so this is a private group. And, um, and I select here, you know, I'll just say, you know, learn more. Then um, I see post to Hypothesis reading, or I can still keep it privately. But um, when you are annotating in a private group, um, and we've done some work lately, uh, you know, I think Nate was just about to mention to to ensure that students, um, you know, are are in the right private group. But you do, um, you know, you every time you make an annotation, uh, it will basically show you uh, kind of your your group of last activity. So I tend to make most of my annotations only me. So it will show up, um, you know, the first thing that will show up here will be only me. And then if I decide to go public, I need to select it. But you do need to. Uh, select it each time. But if I were accidentally in the public channel and not in hypothesis reading, 
um, you know, I might accidentally make an annotation in the wrong place, but it doesn't um, mean that the security of the hypothesis reading group is compromised. Right, so we don't have any examples where uh, annotations are made in a private group and then accidentally get exposed. It's more just, um, you know, the, the issue of a user knowing where they're annotating. And in the, in the LMS integration context, students are automatically enrolled in a private group that has everyone in their course that's in their learning management system enrolled in it as well and so by default they're all annotating in a private group and so there's less room for kind of accidentally Mm -hmm. annotating in the public player in that LMS integration. So that's particular to the teaching and learning context. Um, and just uh, as a side note there, we don't have a way yet to move an annotation from one layer or group to another. So if one did accidentally make an annotation in a public group, one would have to go in, copy it, delete it, and then change to the private group contest text and, and paste it again. Yeah. So um, another question then uh, from uh, Emily. Um, so in restricted groups, is there an administrator who can manage the content within that group? So each group has an administrator. Um, and for restricted groups, it's the, it's this, the same case. Um, the administrator uh, right now is also the moderator. Um, so for many of our publishers, if they have um, you know, more than one person who's going to be uh, taking care of that, they might create a shared uh, account, shared credentials um, to use. Um, we're in the process of building out um, more administrative uh, capabilities, uh, and we're doing that in you know association with our partners to make sure that we do that in a way that will be, will be helpful. Um, for uh, restricted groups where there are um, a certain number of approved uh, annotators, um, the plan is that the administrator would be able to add and remove annotators from the group. Right now, we actually assist um, with that process, um, and there may well be other things. The administrator can change uh, the description of the group, can add um, information, you know, if there is a, a, a user guidelines or a disclaimer or anything like that, that the group um, needs to link to. Uh, you know, again, on the on the group page, if I jump back over to here, um, uh, you can add a, it's not filled in here, but you can add a description for your group that has um, layers like that. Uh, and again, we're, we're looking for feedback from our publishers on what other types of um, administrative needs we could help to meet with this. Great. And, you know, Paul asked a, uh, a kind of follow-up question on, on the question of um, mm -hmm. privacy and groups following up on Sarah. And so, um, you know, really kind of further exploring this idea of whether a member of a private group can share an annotation out with non non group members. And so all the annotations within the private group, even that whole layer, the layer that the private group is attached to, so all the annotations that it contain are really only visible to the people inside that group. So someone so there's no way to share like a single annotation from that private group out to the world, except of course, someone in the group could, copy it and go paste it, you know, they could paste it anywhere, right? They could paste it on Twitter or they could, um, you know, put it in a blog post or they could, you know, send it in an email. Um, but the actual, so, you know, the people in the group, of course, could violate the privacy of the group, but there's no mechanism inside Hypothesis itself to share a single annotation outside of the private context, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, Paul. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So and related, just related to that, I mentioned that if you do share an annotation that the person you share it with doesn't have to have hypothesis, they do have to have access to the content. It's not um, any kind of a backdoor um, to get into subscription content when you're not, uh, when you're not allowed in there, you would see a, a, an indication that you didn't have access. Um, I've also been asked what happens if someone annotates subscription content and then they their subscription ends. So, um, you know, similar to what you see here on the group page, you would still have access to your annotations, but if you tried to follow the, the link through to see them in context, then you would um, come up against the, the publisher paywall. But um, this way, you will always have access uh, to your notes. Uh, one of the upcoming um, features for uh, end users is going to be uh, an export button, you know, from your user page, so that if you're not a technical person, I'm not a technical person, and you don't know uh, maybe how to get up and running with an API, you'll be able to just export your, your annotations right from your activity page. Okay, just one more follow-up question on this uh, kind of privacy issue. And so 
Sarah, I think you might be exploring uh, an issue that you might be having with some annotation that's going on already. And so invite you to get in touch um, with our support folks um, in order to, to clarify that. Um, so you can visit our website. I'll put a link in in just a second and click on the help button or uh, you can email support at hypothesis and I'll put that email in too. But just in short, the most common reason that we see uh, folks not being able to see annotations inside a private group context like that when they believe that they should be able to be seen by the other group members is because they have accidentally posted their annotation as only me. And I think Heather was just kind of showing that. So even within a private group context, you can make annotations that are private only to yourself. So it's like two layers of privacy deep, right? Um, so you're, you're making an annotation in a private group, but then you're also indicating that that annotation, as Heather's showing here, is going to be private only to you. And so if a if someone in the private group does accidentally make a private annotation in a private group, they can go back later and toggle that um, annotation to be uh, shared with the group as opposed to private only to them. Uh, so there is that ability to um, kind of toggle between it being fully private and shared with the group uh, with just uh, as Heather demonstrated there on screen. So I, 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 the I little um, the little lock shows that that's an only me um, rather than public. So. so I hope that helps, Sarah. That's the really usually the most common reason why an annotation can't be seen when one expects it to be seen is that that only me thing. And you can go back and edit it. Just open it up again, toggle it to the group. As 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 Nate mentioned, if you're completely in a different group, you do need to copy it. But if you just need to set it from only me to um, group visibility, you can do that just in the little drop down. So uh, we don't have any other questions queued up right now. If anyone, we're still, we're happy to hang around. We actually scheduled a full hour in case mm -hmm. anybody wanted to have further discussion. We can also open your a mic if someone wants to actually have a voice conversation about something. Yeah. Can I can I show one, um, one thing uh, really quickly, Nate? Um, I don't so see why not. Every person who gets a Hypothesis account, if you just um, click on your name, you'll be able to see all of the annotations, um, all of the highlights, everything that you've, uh, that you've done. Uh, this is my page, so I see my, my public, my private, and my groups. Uh, so you can see some of the, the, the one that I did here, um, the two that I did in the, uh, on top of the plant cell um, are visible here. Um, I can also filter on my tag. So I do a lot of reading about space. So if I can filter by my space tag, um, I can see all of my articles about uh, black holes and uh, Chinese uh, moon landings, and, as well as all my sub tags. Um, I can search my annotations uh, as well. And if I get rid of um, the filters, including my own uh, name, we have access to, you have access then to all of the public annotations made anywhere in the world. So you can see um, what's been happening. Uh, it's not uncommon to come in here, I don't see it today, and see annotations in Chinese, Japanese, uh, Arabic, you know, French, Russian, Spanish, um, you know, and you can search. So if I just want to see uh, things that have to do with uh, education, um, I can I can pop that in. Now it's not a full text search. It will search the metadata for the article, um, the selection that somebody uh, highlighted, as well as anything they wrote about it. Uh, so you can see here somebody's um, doing a project on uh, Marbury versus Madison. If I find an interesting uh, annotator, I can click on their name and see uh, what else they may have annotated. So just a, just a couple of things uh, here. Um, but it's a great way, as I mentioned, to kind of get an idea of what is happening uh, in the space. And these are the ones that are fed out to Crossref event data. So. Great, yeah. And uh, I just, as I noted in the chat there, um, as Heather was indicating, the annotation kind of composition panel supports all languages and character sets, mm -hmm. as well as uh, equations using um, LaTeX. So um, we have another question from Emily. Is it possible for two people to work on the same account at the same time? So um, I imagine that you mean the same document at the same time? Yeah, maybe um, you could clarify, Emily. Uh, 
the same <laughs> hypothesis account or the same document? If, if you're talking about the same document um, and annotate together in real time, definitely uh, you can do that and you'll see a little refresh indicator um, to let you know that there are new annotations since you last came to the page. Um, she actually means, she's clarified that she means, uh, well, both really. She's interested okay. in the answer to both. Yeah. So if you have a shared account, for example, like an admin account, um, I have my account open um, at any given time on multiple browsers. Um, I'm not sure because I'm one person, I wouldn't be actually making an annotation at the same time. So that might uh, potentially muck it up. Um, but uh, we, can, we can dig into that um, a little bit further. But um, you can have, um, you know, obviously as many accounts um, as you like from the, from the publisher side. Uh, it depends on, you know, what your, <clears throat> what your use case is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you want to maybe detail what you're trying to do, what you hope to do a little bit more, we can tell you. Yeah, and actually there shouldn't be any issue. I mean, I don't know that it would be recommended. It would be a, a very specific use case to use the same hypothesis mm -hmm. account um, and at the same time in multiple places. Um, but there shouldn't actually be any issue uh, with that because the way that hypothesis works in its kind of client server architecture, right, is each uh, person, each you know, human who's logged in using an account with a particular document is kind of like, uh, kind of in their own little world. And so um, the two humans could be logged in with the same account in different places and, mm -hmm. and saving annotations to the same account theoretically. So that yeah. should work if there's a use case for it. Yep. So do we have um, any other questions? We're happy to, to converse more if anybody has questions. We really appreciate I will, it. I will say um, one thing we didn't cover in, in this webinar, but I've mentioned in other webinars before, um, there's a lot of publishers who are using Hypothesis for internal workflow solutions. So uh, Springer Publishing, for example, uh, were launching a new ebook platform and they wanted to make sure that their XML was well formed. So they created a group that included their production team and their proofreaders. And um, they uploaded uh, half of the chapters, I think it was 4,000 uh, chapters, and they made annotations in that group uh, for anything that they thought needed to be changed um, on top of the uh, HTML. They made 10,000 annotations, which sounds like a lot, but if you think it's 4,000 chapters, that actually sounds like it's pretty, pretty good uh, HTML there. Um, we're in the process of writing up a, a little white paper about that. And American Society for Microbiology was moving a number of their journals from one part of their platform host to another. And um, they knew that a number of their landing pages would need to change as a result. So uh, rather than printing out the websites and marking them up with stickies and pen and giving them to some poor colleague to follow up on, they created a group uh, in editorial. Um, they asked each other questions right on top of the, the websites, noted links that needed to change. Uh, and then they were able to, um, you know, include that uh, colleague in the group and they could take care of um, those things and they could get a nice handle on where they were in that process. So uh, if you have thought about using Hypothesis for an internal work project, that is the private group uh, functionality. So, you know, you don't need to um, work with us, but if you want our help or our advice in terms of best practices, we're happy to, to support you. Uh, one more follow up with Emily. Is there is there an update um, when when there's an update to the hypothesis uh, extension or plugin or client uh, like a technical update? Does one need to re-download it uh, and install it again? And the answer to that is no. Yeah. Um, it will it will automatically um, update itself mm -hmm. so that the actual hypothesis sidebar and tool that you use to annotate will will update itself. Yeah. And the same is true if. Uh, if a publisher has Hypothesis embedded or a, a website mm -hmm. has Hypothesis embedded in, in their website, um, they won't need to you know, change things on their website in order for users to get any new updates to the actual client functionality that they use to annotate. Yep. Super Great questions, cool. Emily. It looks like you're, uh, you're uh, hard at work using it already. That's great. Emily, Emily can participate in the next webinar. Yeah, we'll have you present, Emily. <laughs> well, if that's it, um, thank you guys uh, so much uh, for your time and attention today. Um, very excited to be here with you. And um, uh, shortly, the video and slides will be added to 
uh, the, uh, the blog post that um, uh, takes care of this webinar. And if you'd love to, we'd love it if you'd share it out with other colleagues. And if you have other questions, I'm Heather at Hypothesis. Um, uh, please do reach out. Um, we have an open Slack channel that you can join. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. And if you have suggestions or ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, everybody, and have a fantastic rest of your day.